All right. Well, thank you for being here. Um, before we get started, I have some I have some things I'd like to invite you to be a part of, and and other things. First, this Friday evening, uh, we're going to be hosting the Concord High School baseball team, and so if you have some time and you'd like to serve there, you may. Uh, at the end of July, we're going to have Vacation Bible School. Uh, it'll be the 25th through the 29th. Uh, in fact, that means that the last day that we meet in here, the last Thursday, will be the 22nd. As we get closer, I'll decide how many weeks we'll miss. We're certainly going to miss the 29th because that's the, the, the week of Vacation Bible School. And um, I'm not as young as I once was. And so after a, a, a week of vacation Bible school at night, I don't know that I'll have the, the juice to, uh, to do this on Thursday. So we'll take that week off and maybe another one or two just, uh, just to get everybody back on the same sheet of music and then we can pick up again. So uh, vacation Bible school, if you would like to help, but you, let's say you want to be a part, but you can't do every night. We can still use you. Just see uh, Miss Corrigan and see where she can put you. You can be a greeter. You can be uh, a helper in a classroom. You can uh, be a hall monitor. You can be a bouncer. Whatever, whatever you need to do. But um, we are. Uh, we'd like to invite you to be a part of of that at the end of the month. And then next week, next Wednesday evening, we've, we've curtailed our Wednesday evenings in person until after Vacation Bible School, just, just to take the summer off. But uh, next Wednesday, we're going to be back in here in this room at 6.30. Uh, Pastor Aaron and I went as messengers from, the, from First Baptist Church to the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, if we're going to be good messengers, we need to return with, uh, with a report. And so that's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll come back and next week uh, give a report. It'll probably be longer than an hour. Um, it'll probably be close to an hour and a half. I've got to do some preliminary stuff. Since this is my very first in-depth report that I give our church, I need to go. Some of you don't have any clue who the Southern Baptist Convention is and what they look like. And so I'm going to go over that about 15 or 20 minutes. And then after that, we're going to go over the issues that were raised and the way that we dealt with them. And then after that, we'll, we'll field questions. So it'll probably be about an hour and a half, six um, And so uh, you don't have to wait that whole time. But I'm just, I, I want to be a realist about it. If we're going to do this, it'll probably take about an hour and a half to do. And so uh, that's next Wednesday evening. You're all invited um, and uh, it'll, but it'll just be a report. We won't do anything else but report. So uh, that's next Wednesday evening. Other than that, things are going really, really well. Uh, we are gearing up. We had a staff meeting yesterday, um, and uh, we are headed toward uh, August and September with um, with excitement to see all the things back that we're going to do. And um, we'll be a, uh, I don't have all the details yet, but we'll have a full lineup on Sunday evening and a full lineup on Wednesday evening and lineup. So all that coming soon. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. Uh, I, I left off about halfway through Exodus 3 last week. I want to read a couple of verses to you after I find my clicker. And so I want to read a few verses to you, and then we'll just pick up through Exodus. We, we'll only get through about Exodus chapter 6. Oh, by the way, let me tell you about the handouts that I gave you. Um, I, I gave you, uh, 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 it's really three excerpts from one verse, three different books talking about Exodus 4.21, um, one of the more difficult passages in Scripture, or maybe not difficult, but debated passages in Scripture is what does God mean when he says he hardens Pharaoh's heart? And so um, because I want this to be similar to what we would discuss in a, in a seminary class, I gave you three differing views of what that means. So those three passages are differing. They're not completely different, but they are from different perspectives. And I just want you to have something to read and think about. Uh, I'm not trying to persuade you in any direction on that course, I'd be happy to talk about it from my perspective if you'd like. 
but uh, I just give you three perspectives because it is a discussion um, that uh, that's had when we get to the statement. It's not just in Hebrews; it's also in Psalm 105, and then also in Romans 9, uh, where it talks about that God raised up Pharaoh for this just for this instance. And so we have to do something with it. And so I just give you three different somethings that you can do with it. Um, or you could just ignore it if you'd like, but that's probably not the right thing to do. Uh, you probably need to, to uh, wrestle with the Scripture and find out exactly what it means. And when we get there, I'll, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, perhaps. Uh, but that's what that is. Um, don't read it and think I'm messing with you. Um, I'm not messing with you. If you were seminary students, I would mess with you. Um, I am not messing with you, though. I am, I'm just trying to broaden your, your thought process um, as, you, as you grapple with God's Word. So, Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse number 13. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, and then we'll just get going. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers have sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord your, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it, and after that he will let you go." I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. That's Exodus chapter 3. So let's just look at this together, and we'll use this as our jumping-off point to head through about chapter 6. Uh, I'm just calling this one Back to Egypt. And, uh, and so there's a picture of, of Egypt from modern day. Uh, Moses did not snap this shot on his Polaroid on the way out. This is, uh, this is recent. Um, Hebrews 11:27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. So um, this is Moses. Moses left at age 40. He was kind of chased out of Egypt. He went and he was a uh, shepherd for 40 years in Midian and served his father-in-law Jethro or Ruel um, for those 40 years. And at the end of that 40-year period, uh, God came to him, the burning bush we talked about last week. Uh, the Lord showed up in the middle of the burning bush, got his attention, um, and that's where we are right now. We're at the burning bush and God is talking to Moses, commissioning him for his task for the last 40 years of his life. Um, not to offend anyone, but do we have any 80-year-olds here? All right, I want you to look around. Keep your hands up. We have uh, about eight, seven of you here, 80-year-olds. Uh, now, what if God were to call you at this time in your life and say, all right, now you're going to go lead my people out of Egypt, and you've got 40 years to do it? <laughs> uh, Brother Jimmy, you think you can handle that? Yeah, with God's help. That's the right answer. That is the right answer. I tell you, I'm 50, and I don't think I'd want to go on that task. You know, I, um, but, uh, but here we have 80-year-old Moses, and God calls him to go out. I know, I know asking people their age in public isn't supposed to be a good thing, but you're going to see through this book and in later in numbers, you're going to see that uh, we have some 80-year-olds who are pretty tough. Uh, in fact, my favorite 85-year-old 
Caleb says, uh, says a little bit later, he says, uh, uh, I am as strong today as I was 40 years ago. Now, I want to be like that when I'm 85. I want to be able to say I'm as strong today as I was 45 years ago. But this is most. God calls him. So um, here we have, starting in verse 13, the completion of God's commission of Moses. Now I want I want to go back over his name, and uh, and then we'll go we'll we'll go there. So God says there, I am. In fact, He says, I am who I am, and He said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Um, We've heard this, the great I am. That's how we've heard this statement made. This is actually a, um, a, an interpretation of his name. Uh, I told you earlier, uh, many, many weeks ago, 15 or 16 weeks ago, that uh, this is the only four-letter word in the Hebrew language that's, that's four consonants. So all the consonants in the Hebrew language are based on three letters. Uh, three consonant letters, all the words, I didn't mean all the consonants, all the, all the words are based on three consonants, and then they add other consonants when they add, um, when they add other words together. So they, they'll add endings, we would call them suffixes, those kinds of things. They add those on, which changes the name, um, but, uh, but they're all based on three letters. The, the tetragrammaton, the four-letter word, is God's name, and it is three letters in its base form. It doesn't break down any any further than that because it is His name. But His name is a derivation of the word to be. Uh, I am. Uh, uh, I was, I am, I will be, all wrapped up in this this word. Uh, Therefore, His name denotes. Do you all know the difference between denotes and connotes? So uh, if something denotes, if a word, the denotation of a word means it's it's specific uh, interpretation or it's specific, what it really means. So if it denotes something, that's what it means. So in this case, his name denotes self-existence, immutability, that is unchangeableness. He's he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Self-existence, immutability, and eternity. All of that is wrapped up in the denotation of his name. Connotation, something that connotes or connotes, is, uh, means the, uh, the emotional baggage that goes with it. So um, there, is, there, there, there are words that mean something specifically, but they also carry emotions that go with it. And so the connotation of his name is covenant, redemption and messiah these all of these are wrapped up in this name um, but they're they're it's the emotional language it's, it's what it connotes it it's it's the broader use of his name so when we hear when he says that this is my memorial name for all generations what it means is he's giving this name as as a platform for all of the redemption of israel to be built upon and so that's what he's doing here. That's the idea of, of his name. So whenever you hear the name I am, you ought to think, uh, just like the name Jesus, the name Jesus, the, the denotation of it is rescuer or uh, deliverer. It comes from the word Joshua, um, uh, Yeshua, the same, the same name as Joshua who fit the battle of Jericho, if you keep up with that. So same Joshua, same name, deliverer. But the name Jesus, yes, sir, you have a question? Where are you? Yeah, so, so, here's, what, so here's what I believe. I believe that that this is the second person of the Godhead there. So yes, pre-incarnate Christ. We wouldn't really say Jesus. Um, in the weirdness or the strangeness of talking about the, the triune God, um, Jesus, he wasn't incarnate as Jesus until he was born. But yes, the second person of the Godhead, the, the, the Christ, the one who is going to be... Um, <laughs> 
the Christ. <laughs> this is so difficult to talk. None of our verb usage really wraps up God. But in this case, there was a time when, when God was not incarnate. He became incarnate when He was born of Mary. So the, really, one of the only changes that you could ever say about God is that time. But, so yes, I think this is the second person of the Godhead. But in verse 18, what He is saying is He's telling He's telling Moses what to go say to Pharaoh. So what, what Moses is going to say to Pharaoh, uh, actually in that, in that case, what he's going to say to the Israelites uh, is say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. So, that's, so Moses is going to say to Pharaoh, the Lord has met with us. Now let us go that we may go sacrifice to the Lord. That's what that is. That, that's what that means. So it's not, it's not God going to sacrifice to God. This is God telling Moses what to go to say to Pharaoh. And he's going to go say to them, you need to let us go so that we can go out and, and sacrifice. Is that, that, okay. All right. So, uh, so anyway, so Jesus' uh, Jesus's name really means deliverer. But for us, for those of us who are following Jesus, it connotes it has the emotion of all kinds of other things uh, sweetest name i know you know the, those kind of things that's the idea of the difference between denotation and connotation does that make sense i just want you to understand that this name is packed with power and whenever you hear it uh, so the, the the copyists of the old testament when they would the scribes when they would write they would come to the name uh, uh, the name of the Lord, this covenant name of the Lord, and they would change their writing utensils. They would go and get rid of the one they were using and, and use a brand new one. They would go and bathe after writing this. Now, I think some of it might be a little extreme, but they would go and bathe because this name was so precious as they, as they dealt with it. In fact, I told you last week that they actually grew out of usage of using it because they wanted to hallow it so much. But there's a danger in in that distance even then even then so that's the name um, but then he wanted to say that so the lord then said to moses when you go the hebrews are going to be willing they're going to receive you so that was moses's worry when they when i go and tell them they're going to say who sent me and he said tell them i am sent you and they'll be willing but the egyptians won't be willing the Egyptians are not going to let you go except by compulsion. Um, the idea is they're, unless they're forced to let you go, they're not going to let you go. And so to, to, com, to make them let the Hebrews go, Yahweh God will stretch out His hand. Uh, and that's, that's what He says, verse 20, So I will stretch out My hand and strike Egypt with all My miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it, and after that He will let you go. By the way, just an interesting thing. Egypt and Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt are all seen as one person. All right, So uh, I'll strike Egypt and He will let you go. So in, in the mind of the Egyptians, Pharaoh stood for all of the Egyptians and he represented all the gods in their pantheon. And it's possible that the, that the, Egyptian, the Egyptians had the most polytheistic um, uh, culture in all of the history of the world. They had little g gods for everything, and, but uh, Pharaoh represented all of them. And so th this is why when, when Yahweh God confronts Pharaoh, we have something bigger than just a political release. This is, this is something big that's happening there. So, um, so God would stretch out His hand, and the Hebrews will plunder Egypt. Now this is a fantastic thought, that as, uh, as God uh, releases, redeems the people he lets them go not in poverty but in wealth and that wealth we'll get to this at the end of exodus but that wealth was used for one specific purpose does anybody know what that was yeah the tabernacle that's absolutely right the building of the tabernacle so he says you shall overlay it with gold 
Well, where'd they get gold in the wilderness? Egypt. You shall build the curtains out of red and purple. And where did they get that stuff? Egypt. In fact, the, one of the funniest scenes in all the Bible, it's funny to me, it probably wasn't funny to the Egyptians, but the, one of the funniest scenes is at the, at the culmination of the 10th plague when they're just they're telling Moses and the, and the Hebrews, get out of here, we don't want to see you anymore. They're like, and take this, and take this, and take this, and here's gold, get out of here, we don't want you anymore. And, they just, and, it, and it says, and thus they plundered Egypt. They, they went in as, as needy beggars. They lived for 400 years as slaves, and they left rich as kings, <laughs> bearing out all the, all the wealth of Egypt. So it's just an interesting thing that the Lord does with them. So God completes His commissioning of Moses there in chapter 3. But that's not all, because Moses has some problems. Does anybody know what Moses' problems are? You say he stutters, I say he has no faith. He has no faith. That's the problem. Because, because and, and I can say this because God answers him in that way. He says, don't you know I'm the one that made your mouth? Don't you know I'm the one that did that? And so I just say it that way to get your attention, that often you and I have all kinds of excuses why we can't do what we ought to be doing. Well, I can't, I'm not really good with kids, or I don't talk really well, or all, you know, we have all kinds of things. I'm old. I'm old. I'm 80 years old. <laughs> and, and so, you know, whatever, I've got all this stuff that I can't do. And all the while, what it really says is we're not trusting the Lord to use us in the way that he says that he'll use us. So Moses objects to God's plan. Starting in verse number one of chapter four, Moses said, if they will not believe me or listen to what I say, for they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So he's got some, he's got some objections. His, uh, his first objection is, what if they won't listen to me? What if they don't listen to me? Now that's a pretty good objection. What if I go all the way back there and they don't, and they don't listen? So God says this, you see that staff that's in your hand? Now he had just a normal shepherd's staff. It was, a, it was a stick, probably a big stick, um, that he used, a walking stick. He used it to probably fight off predators. He used it to help sheep, uh, those kinds of things. But um, God says, you see that stick in your hand? He goes, yeah. He said, throw it on the ground. And, uh, and so he threw it on the ground. Well, immediately, that stick became a serpent. And the Bible says that Moses fled from it. Now, I'm in the habit of fleeing any serpent. That's typical of what I do. Uh, now, I don't mind going getting a hoe and killing the, 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 the snake. I'm, I'm okay with that. But if I see one, I'm going to step back at least one or two steps. But if that serpent only moments before had been a stick in my hand, I may really, really flee from it. <laughs> I mean, that's a different kind of snake altogether. Um, you can have poisonous snakes, and you can have non-poisonous snakes, and then you can have snakes that used to be sticks only moments before, and that's scary. And so that's what he says. God gives him the miracle sign of the staff. God then says, grab it, grab the snake. Well, that took a little bit of faith, I guess. And so he reached down, and he grabbed the snake, and it became a, uh, it became a stick in his hand again. Now, I want you to know, we often talk about this, and then we leave it okay, like it was done, but it happened a couple of more times that's that the, for whatever whatever god did to that stick um he kept doing to that stick several more times so this is this is one of those signs it wasn't just a sign for for moses it was also a sign for the children of israel if they don't believe you do it again and it was also a sign for the magicians and Pharaoh in his court. We'll see, that's not me, but we'll see in just a moment that he, uh, well not today probably, but that he throws it down. The, the uh, magicians in the court mimic it. They make theirs turn into a serpent. And then uh, Moses' serpent eats up, eats up the other two serpents. So 
uh, God gives the miracle sign of the staff to the serpent. So that's the first thing he says here. Um, throw the staff down. This is, a, you know, this is, uh, that, so verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to you. So he's got that. Um, and then verse 6, then the Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, it was leprous like snow. So not only did he give him the, the sign of the, the serpent, or the st- stick that becomes a serpent, he gave him the miracle sign of the leprous hand. And so that too is going to be, um, is going to be used as, as a sign. Verse 8, if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. Uh, and then he, he alludes to another one, but he doesn't, it's not performed right there in front of Moses. If they don't believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So really three different signs that God gives Moses to use in the presence of those to show that he belongs to the Lord. So... Um, that's, his, that's the answer to his first objection. What if they don't believe me? God says, I'll give you three signs so that you can perform in front of them that they will believe, they will believe you. But these also serve not just as um, proof that the Lord sent uh, Moses back to the Israelites in Egypt. It was also a, 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 a strengthening of Moses' faith while he was in the wilderness. So um, I can imagine, you know, you would think that after grabbing the tail of a snake that had just been a stick um, and it turned back into a stick, you would think that that would be, you know, if you, if you witness that, you could handle anything, I would think. But th- that may not compare to sticking your own hand in your, in, inside of your robe and pulling it back out and you have the most deadly disease known to them at the time, and then putting it back in and coming out, and you'd be, you'd be cleansed of it, healed of it. And so these are remarkable uh, miracles that God demonstrated before him. So you may ask me, Pastor, do you really think those things happened? Um, and I have a long answer, and I have a short answer. The short answer is yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, the long answer is yes, absolutely. The uh, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely believe that God because um, if he didn't, if if this didn't happen, then nothing happened. You know, that, then then the rest of this is just a fable, and it's not a fable. It, this is the way that the Lord rescued them from Egypt. He comes out with the second objection: I'm not a good speaker. I'm not eloquent. Um, and uh, or to quote uh, to quote my favorite theologian Forrest Gump, I am not a smart man. <laughs> I am not a smart man, but um, but God God reminds him of his power. So verse ten. Then the Lord, then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. For I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Now this is a dangerous position that Moses has put himself in. Um, The Lord reminds Moses of his power. He said, I'm the one that gives people the ability to speak. I'm the one that makes people blind or seeing. I, I can make them speak or deaf or, or whatever. I, I'm the one that controls all that. You can trust me. That's what the Lord is saying to Moses. Moses, however, does not receive that word. What we have before is Moses being, in, um, uh, being uh, reassured by the, the miracle signs. But in this case... He is not reassured. Now, this is an interesting thought because in this case, all he has is the word of the Lord. When he sees, he's okay. When he's asked to have faith, he's not okay. And and that's summed up in this verse. 
But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. That is not, well, it may be exactly what we do, but I was about to say, it's not like saying your will be done. Um, When Jesus said your will be done, what he meant was, I will do exactly what you tell me to do. You know, Lord, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I will do exactly what you say. In this case, what Moses is doing is trying to step away from this calling. So he says, he says let you send whoever you will. It's his way of saying, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to do this. I can't do this. This is not what I want to do. You say, well, how do you know that? How do you get that from the text? Well, because what happens in verse 14, it says, Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Now, why is he upset with Moses? He's upset with Moses because Moses did not accept his word where he said, I can do this through you, just go do it. And so Moses' response is less than adequate. Verse 14, the Lord said, "Is Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Now, I want you to see that the Lord gives Aaron as his mouthpiece. In fact, what he says later is, you will be a God to Pharaoh. This is what he's saying to Moses. Moses, you're going to be like God to him, and Aaron will be like a priest to you. So, So you're going to speak to Aaron, and Aaron's going to speak to Pharaoh. And that's the way that it went. Uh, Now, the reason why um, I believe that he said that, and we'll look at it later, why he said that to Moses, you'll be like a god to him, is because, remember, Pharaoh thought that he was a god representing uh, to all the people. And so now we have this human form, Moses, who is absolutely representing God to Pharaoh, and that's that's the way it works. Um, But I want you to understand something. Moses forfeited some of his blessing by disobeying the Lord. He forfeited it. Had he obeyed, now I know we're we're talking about hypotheticals now, so understand that. But had he obeyed, hypothetically, he would have received all the blessing of the Lord. Now he's encumbered by his brother, Aaron. Now, Aaron was a good speaker. Aaron was a blessed man. Aaron and all his progeny became the the, uh, priesthood for God's people. So he was blessed in that way. But Aaron brought his own problems to the table. And we'll see those later. But but Aaron being there, Aaron rebelled against Moses' leadership, at least on one occasion. Aaron rebelled against God's leadership on at least one occasion. He let the people, he led the people into debauchery on the on the uh, wilderness floor. So this is not only a blessing of the Lord by saying you've got your brother. There are other things um, that happen because of Moses' lack of faith right here at this moment. Are there any questions about that? Everybody see that? Everybody understand? Okay, good. I, and I don't mean that, that Moses was cursed by his brother. I don't mean that. I just mean that God didn't receive, I mean that, that Moses didn't receive the full amount of blessing that he might have received had he been obedient. Yeah, there are consequences of your choices. And that leads me to a preaching point. I haven't preached it all today, so let me just, let me just leave this. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus... If you repent of your sins and trust Christ, you know, the Bible says we're all sinners. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible also says that Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He died a death in our place. He stepped into your place and in mine, bore our sin on himself, our sin debt, really. Um, He bore our sin debt, the wages of that sin on himself. He died in our place. They buried him because he was dead. He, uh, he rose again on the third day, the Father accepting His sacrifice for our sins. So that whoever, puts their, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you'll be saved from your sin. You'll get heaven and all the blessings of heaven that go with it. But let me just suggest something to you 
that there will be in heaven a, a, a blessing among us of rewarding things that are done in the flesh. There will be a sense in which the Lord blesses what we do now that we belong to the Lord. So um, there'll, be, there'll be rewards in heaven. Everybody believes that, right? I mean, that's biblical teaching. But here's, the, here's a, a, real, a real truth. If we're disobedient, even though our lives will be saved, even though we'll be in heaven for all eternity, we can still forfeit some of those blessings in heaven. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he talked about uh, the, 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 where uh, what's done in the flesh will be tried by fire. And, and the things that are done for the Lord will be refined like gold and silver and fine jewels that, that fire refines. But the hay, wood, and stubble, the, the junk in our life, will be burned off. And there will be a sense, I don't think it Personally, the Bible doesn't address this. Personally, I don't think it lasts forever in heaven, but there will be a sense in which there is loss of what could have been had we been obedient in the moment. Or else Paul wouldn't have used that as a, as a, as a means of saying we ought to live for the Lord. Now, I don't mean there's loss in heaven, so I didn't mean to express it quite that way, but there will be a sense of seeing things burned up at, at the judgment where we're like, oh, wait, you mean my life really didn't have the impact it could have? That's exactly what we see here in Moses' life. Everybody good with that? Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, however... I agree with for rewards, for rewards, not for punishment, not for punishment. All of the punishment for all of our sins was on Christ at the cross, but for rewards, yes, absolutely. And the only reason why I'm not saying you thought otherwise, I just, we want to make sure everyone understands that Christ's death on the cross saved us from all of our sins not just the sins before we trusted Christ. All of our sins have been removed, the record of all of our sins at the cross. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? All right, good. Yes, ma'am. Way in the back. I see that hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. There won't be any argument. That's right. It'll be a righteous... Yeah, it'll, it'll, and we'll respond in worship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there won't be, we won't be sniveling little wires when it happens. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be worship when it happens. And if you get all of the, if you get all the rewards, like you get more rewards than Paul, like, you know, they just heap it out. All you're going to do is turn right around and give them to the Lord Jesus. You, you surrender them right back to him. That's the picture that's given there. So everybody good? Nobody's confused. All right, good. Uh, I just like to, I want you to see that this is what happens right here. That God does make a way for Aaron, but he loses out on some of the reward from being the, the only person. All right. So then we have, now this was taken in his court, I think. Um, somebody had a, a camera right there. Um, I, it doesn't look like a selfie, but this is... <laughs> This is Pharaoh. Moses obeys God's plan. I just say that to let you know that we don't have any like pictures of Pharaoh. I just want you to know that. Um, these are just, I don't even know where this came from. I just grabbed it. I thought it looked, it looked regal, so I put it up there. So uh, Moses obeys God's plan. Moses then goes and clears the way with Jethro. So he goes to Jethro, his father-in-law, and says, uh, now why do you think he did that to Jethro? Why do you think he went and told Jethro, I'm leaving? He was married to his daughter. He was part of his family. And oh, by the way, he needed to get somebody else to watch the sheep because he's leaving. Uh, they're all going. So all of this, uh, it, it serves a purpose. There is still a sense of, um, 
forgive me to use this word in today's context, but patriarchy. Um, Jethro was the father over the family, and so Moses went and reported. And here it is. I'm, I'm giving this. So, so he goes and clears the way with Jethro. By the way, that's not the last time we see Jethro. Um, he will make it back. Uh, and then the Lord prepares. Uh, oh, Jethro blesses him with peace, and then God promises him peace. In verse 19 of chapter 4, uh, Mo, verse 18, Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So you're going to be able to go back in peace. So Jethro says, Go in peace. And the Lord says, indeed, you're going to go in peace. You're going to get back, and nobody's going to want to kill you. Don't be fearful. Don't fret for your life. Go back and do this thing. And so Moses heads out with God's presence. Verse 20, so Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Notice it's no longer Moses' staff. Isn't that interesting? You see the difference? It's, uh, the Lord said, what's that in your hand? And he said, it's a staff. He said, throw it down. And he did. And it became a snake. He said, pick it up. And he did. And now it's the staff of God. Not only is it a staff that turns into a snake and back into a staff, but it's the representation of the presence of God with Moses. And so that's why it matters. It's not a magic stick. Okay, I, I, you got to understand, this is not a wand or some kind of a witchcrafty thing. This is a, a, a physical object that represents God's presence with him. When Moses throws down the stick in front of the people, it's not in the stick to turn into a snake. It's the Lord's presence that turns it into a snake. And it's the Lord's presence that turns it back into a stick. It's representative of God's presence there, not just the stick. Everybody good with that? The same thing, because you're going to run into this in the book of Numbers when uh, the people are being afflicted by the, the, by the serpents in the wilderness. They're all biting them and killing them. And he said, but whoever looks at the serpent that's been lifted up in the wilderness, they'll be saved. It's not, the, it's not that serpent on the stick that matters. It's the act of trusting the Lord and the power of God that rescues them. And so that's what we see uh, right here. So um, that's verse 20. Then the Lord, let's see, God confronts Moses. Oh, wait a second. Let's go back. The Lord prepares Moses for, uh, for Egypt. And so this is in verses 21 to 23. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So first, the Lord says, you're going to go and the people are going to hear you, but Pharaoh will not listen to you. Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. In fact, the Lord says, I will harden his heart so that he won't listen to you. You are not going to, he, you're not going to, you're going to say it, but he's not going to believe it. And so um, that, that's the second thing. God will harden Pharaoh's heart. So either God did harden Pharaoh's heart or God did not harden Pharaoh's heart. Those are our two choices when it comes to God hardening his heart. I happen to believe, since it says it in clear language in verse 21, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, what I don't believe is that Pharaoh wanted to be nice and kind and joyful and happy and pleasing to the Lord, but God wouldn't let him. I don't believe that. I believe that God took what was already there and calcified it. Just said, you're going to stay that way until I get done with you. 
That's all I'm going to say about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. I want you all to go read those, those passages later. And then next week, if you'd like to ask some questions about them or we want to talk about it, then do it. I don't want to poison the well. I want you to read and just hear different views before we go very further. Is that good? Everybody okay with that? All right, good. So let's go on. Because this isn't the only place in the text that says God will harden his heart. But it also, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. There are other things here. But notice the very first time we see it, it's, it's God saying, I'm going to harden his heart. So just keep that in mind. And then the end of all this will be plague 10. Now, last week I introduced you to this thought, but I want you to understand that there was never any hesitation in any language that the Lord used speaking to Moses that they weren't going to all the the tenth plague. There was never a time that they were only going to go to three plagues or seven plagues. It was always going to number ten. You say, how do you know? Because of what it says right here. You shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now that is a foreshadowing of the tenth plague. Not the first plague, not the seventh plague, but the tenth plague. And so I believe that from the very beginning, God was making sure that he was going to get the plague number ten. And, and that, that was clearly in view before it ever happened. Is everybody okay with that? Everybody see why I think that? It, it's important. We, we're not going to talk much about the plagues today. In fact, I don't have much time left. But, um, but I, I do want you to see that we're, we will talk about it soon. But, um, but that was the end of this. So then, um, so that the Lord prepares Moses for Egypt. And then Moses leaves. So in verse 24... They're on the way now. Moses and his wife Zipporah and their kids. They're on the way. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. That's Moses. All right. This is God's way of saying, "Er, time out. You're in a bad spot. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet, and she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, that is the Lord, let him alone. At that time she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Here's what I believe this is about. God sent Moses to establish his covenant, that is God's covenant, with his people. And that covenant sign of God with his people was circumcision. So Moses picks up his family to go be the messenger of the covenant and yet he had his youngest son absent from bearing the sign of being in the covenant. That's so far. Probably, now the the next two things I say are probably, not definitely, Probably the youngest son had not been circumcised because Zipporah didn't want him to be. You say, why do you think that? Because of her reaction to Moses. She was not a happy camper. In fact, anybody here British? All right, good. What I'm about to say, if I said in front of a British person, it would be swearing, and so I don't mean it to be a swear, but it's like she said, you are a bloody husband to me. That's what she, you're a bridegroom of blood. That's what she says. And so uh, it's probably her, her persuasion of Moses why the youngest son was not circumcised. The second probably, what was the second probably? Uh, blah, 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 blah. That may be the only probably. There was another one I was going to tell you. Okay, so anyway, so here's what's happened. Moses is on his deathbed right here. That's the other probably. He's on his deathbed. You say, why is he on his deathbed? Well, because the Lord sought to kill him, 
and because he wasn't the one to perform the circumcision. So it's usually the father who circumcises the son in the Hebrew culture of that day. She does it. Why? Because he's incapacitated. God is killing him. That's what's happening right now. We read this and just let it go. Oh, well, okay, he had another com- confrontation. God is in the act of killing Moses because of his disobedience. And so Zipporah goes and circumcises her son. <laughs> Well, anyway, this is pretty nasty. But anyway, she, she she circumcises her son, flings the skin at him, and says, basically, you're a bloody husband to me. You're, you're a bridegroom of blood. But God relented when they were obedient. So this is, this is one step further in preparing him, Moses, to represent God in Egypt. So... If you're going to preach this, you preach it like this. There are some things possibly in our life that God is going to remove from our lives so that we can further represent Him and what He calls us to do. There are some things that you're just not going to be able to do or keep or have or some things that you're going to do to be His servant. Does that make sense? All right. How many of you have ever contemplated that story before? Anybody ever thought what was going on there? I think that's what it is. I think that, that they disobeyed the Lord. I think they disobeyed the Lord because Zipporah didn't want it to happen. And by the way, that was God's judgment on Zipporah, not to make her sick, but to make her perform the circumcision. You see, I, I, all of this is kind of reality discipline that God gives His people. So any other questions about that? God accepted Zipporah's act as obedience to the covenant. He let Moses go. So that's what happens. Uh, And then, verses 27 and 28, Aaron and Moses reunite. This is God's promise to Moses. They'll put them back together. Um, And uh, and so Moses, uh, let's see, yeah, they meet again. And then the people are gathered and informed of God's plan. Verses 29 to 31 Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. So here's what it is. The Lord speaks to Moses, Moses speaks to Aaron, Aaron speaks to the people. That's what's going on here. And then Aaron, uh, he then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they'd heard the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshipped. So their response is to worship. The Lord remembered, and now we worship. And so that's uh, uh, the people respond to Yahweh's concern. They responded with worship. Um, and by the way, that's, that's the same thing that Jill was um, alluding to earlier when our response to the Lord in heaven will be to worship. Our constant response over everything ought to be worship to the Lord. That ought to be the way that we respond to the Lord when we're corrected, when we're rewarded, when we're blessed, when we're cursed. Um, just like Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, our response ought to be to worship. So, um, in chapter 5, I know we're going quick, but I'm going to finish up. Um, chapter 5, verses 1 to 21, Yahweh God confronts Pharaoh. Just look at verse number 1 of chapter 5. And afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go so that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. So Yahweh confronts Pharaoh, the confrontation, Let my people go. It's the Lord speaking through Moses, through Aaron, to Pharaoh But everybody knows there's not a doubt in anybody's mind in that room who was speaking. The Lord is confronting Pharaoh. Pharaoh responds with ignorance. He he confesses his ignorance. Who is Yahweh? Now what we read in verse 2, but Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should open my voice to let Israel go? He's not really saying who's the Lord. He's saying who's Yahweh. He, He really wants to know. This may be the very first time that Pharaoh has ever heard the name Yahweh. So this is not necessarily a game. He's just saying, who who is this foreign God that you're bringing up to me that I ought to obey him? Well, he's going to find out, isn't he? Then, 
I do not know Yahweh, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence and the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. So Pharaoh increases the Hebrews' workload. Because of this confrontation, he then turns around and increases their workload, makes them work more with less, do more, get back to work. And the people are now upset with Moses and Aaron because you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight. Um, (laughs) It was bad enough that we were slaves earlier. Now we're really, really slaves. We're bad slaves. Now, just remember that it won't be too long from now that they're like, hey, we would love to be back and be slaves for Pharaoh. (laughs) So anyway, that's that's what we see. But this is this is verses one to twenty one in chapter five. That's the story they tell. We don't need to go in depth with it. So then Yahweh, the Lord, reassures Moses in chapter six. Moses returned to the Lord, 5.22, O Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? If it gets worse, why did you send me? Any of you have ever asked the Lord that? Yeah. Why did you tell me to do that? It just got worse. Well, because God's not done. Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Uh, You sent me here to deliver them, but you have not delivered them at all. So Moses uh, expresses discouragement. Why do you ever send them? Yahweh then makes promises again. Notice God's God's habit. He responds to trouble with promise, which means, trust me, this is the same with us. That's why we need to give ourselves to the reading of God's Word. That's how He gives us many precious promises— through His Word, so that we will exercise faith in Him. This is the way of the Lord. The Lord tells us to do something. We we obey. We may come across trouble, trial, difficulty. It may not look like it's working. We question Him. He responds by giving us more promises so that we will trust Him. Because at the bottom of all this, that's that's what it's about. Us trusting the Lord. So, He makes promises his first promise (laughs) now it's going to get real (laughs) that's what he says Uh, if uh, if you've heard the colloquial maybe you have kids or grandkids that say oh it's real now that's what God says right here in verse number two God spoke further to Moses and said to him I am the Lord and I appeared to Abraham Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty but my name Lord I did not make myself known to them I established my covenant with them uh, say therefore I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Lord of, of the Egypt um, one more so he says it, it's going to get real it's going to happen uh, oh by the, verse one is what I should have read now you will see what I'll do now you're going to see what I'm going to do it gets real uh, I am Yahweh in verse two the God of your fathers but they did not know the extent of this this is not saying that they did not know me by by my name that's not what it means that they didn't that my name was mysterious to them because if you go back you'll read that the lord the lord yahweh shows up to abraham and those things what this means is they didn't know the extent of my name well what's the extent of my name redemption remember i talked to you earlier about connotation the extent of god's name is redemption they're going to see through mighty power that I'm going to redeem you from Egypt. By the way, you and I know the Lord by His full name. We know the redemption that He has. If you indeed have repented of your sins and trusted Christ, you know this. The angels who probably are aware of His name, do, they, they long to look in to see the redemption that you and I have. This is because the experience of the redemption, and that's what, that's what he's saying to Moses. Everybody clear with that? Everybody good? Okay. I didn't want you to think that somehow Yahweh was unknown to Moses or, I mean, to Abraham or to Isaac or Jacob. It just means that they didn't, re, they didn't re, know him in this full way. I will rescue Israel based on my covenant with Abraham. Notice that. Furthermore, let's see, uh, verse 4, I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. 
Well, when did they sojourn there? They didn't. This generation was born and reared, grew up in Egypt. So when did they live in, when did they live in Canaan? When Abraham did. This covenant is passed on through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, to this whole people, and they are still recipients of that blessing. So too, you and I are recipients of the blessings, the promises of God, not in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but in who? In Jesus. So all the blessings of the heavenlies are ours in Christ. Does that make sense? This is the picture throughout the Old Testament. I will rescue Israel based on my promise, my covenant with Abraham. Yahweh then instructs, uh, let's see, I remember my covenant. Now go tell the people. He instructs Moses to go pass on. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, verse 6, 7, and 8. So he says, go tell them. Now the Lord spoke to to Moses, so Moses, verse 9, so Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel. So he did, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. So they are, uh, they're despondent now because they're working so hard and so, it's so terrible. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Go tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his hand. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the Israelites didn't respond. Moses continued to falter, and that's where we're going to leave it today. That Moses is now saying, I told you I couldn't speak. I told you none of this would work. I told you, Lord, but you sent me, and here I am. So that's where we're going to leave off, because next week what we're going to see is God start to do something mighty, both to, but also in front of the people in Egypt. And that's going to be next week. What questions do you have? I covered a lot, kind of, not very far in other ways, but there there are very important foundations that we find in, in this passage. Everybody good? Questions? Anybody? All right. When's lunch? Right now. So uh, let me ask a blessing on this and then I'll let you go. Lord, thank you for your word. Please use this to strengthen us, to make us more like Christ. Bless us now as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for being here. It'd be a terrible class without you. <laughs>